Good afternoon, everyone. Everybody hear me okay? I'm tied to a microphone today. I can't find it. It's only one bright light. Hi, my name is Jeff Mann. Thank you for coming this afternoon. If you were trying to see me yesterday at noon, it, I couldn't make it here because I was stuck in Canada. Um, but that's not all bad. Um, this is my name, my contact information. Uh, in case you want to ever get in touch with me, and feel free to reach out to me. I like uh, talking to people, answering questions. Uh, I like asking questions. And if by the end of the talk you want to get in touch with me, I might have this at the end again, but uh, uh, easiest way to find me is Mr. Jeff Mann on Twitter. Um, very briefly, just a snapshot of my background. I've been in the information security business for about 35 years. Uh, spent the first part in the Department of Defense, primarily in the National Security Agency, which is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, been out in the private sector for the last 23 years doing mostly consulting advisory work. Uh, started out doing a lot of penetra penetration testing, vulnerability assessments, basically going out and talking to companies and trying to help them figure out their security problems and make them more secure. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that I spent a good amount of time in the PCI world to which you're supposed to respond, drink. Anybody have something for me? Um, uh, my company uh, lets me uh, do a lot of this talking, so I have to have one obligatory slide to talk about them. It's a company called Online Business Systems, which nobody's ever heard of. It's been around for about 30 years. A guy that I used to work with in consulting in PCI uh, my old boss actually uh, started a security practice with this, what was essentially a, a software IT services company, uh, about six years ago. I've been there just about a year. Uh, we help companies do security. We help them figure out what's best for them. We don't go in there and sell a specific uh, product or set of services. We try to work with them. Uh, we're growing very quickly. If anybody's interested in the consulting world and is looking for work, uh, please see me afterwards. There, you know, doesn't hurt to have a conversation. Um, I need to apologize at the outset uh, for this talk because this talk is really uh, a historical talk about what I used to do in the final years at NSA, which was back in the early to mid '90s. And what I discovered when I was trying to put together cool slides is uh, this is how we used to do screenshots back in the day, and uh, so. I, I apologize for the, the limited graphics that you're going to see in the presentation today. Um, one of the things that uh, I will have interspersed throughout the talk is uh, a couple uh, different, at various points, some important dates in the history of information security. This is a, a way for us to interact a little bit. So there's sort of a quiz throughout the, throughout the talk. I'll give you an example. Does anybody know what's important? Shout it out if you know about the date, August 29th, 1997. Shout it out if you know. Judgment Day? Close. Give up? Yeah, so it's more or less Judgment Day. You're, you're kind of right. Um, and I'm going to apologize also because I have to kind of move quickly because I've got like 90 slides to get through. I've done it before, and but... I'm dragging a little bit. So I spent years, at, 10 years at NSA from 1986 to 1996. Uh, in my time there, I started out as a cryptographer, a cryptanalyst. Um, I give a talk. I did, well, I did all these other things, which is what I'm talking about today. Um, I gave a talk a few years ago called Tales from the Crypt Analyst. Uh, which basically talked about the first six or seven years that I was at NSA when I was doing cryptography. The last thing I did at NSA was the bulk of what we're going to talk about today, um, which was getting into to penetration testing and red teaming. Um, but just as a brief recap, because I think it's somehow tripping on a cord here. It, it applies a little bit to sort of the formations, at least, uh, of my career and my, my mindset of being a hacker. Uh, when I first started out at NSA, one of my first assignments was uh, my customer approached me. Uh, I was working in what was called the manual crypto systems shop. We produced paper crypto systems, primarily one-time pads. And I had a customer come to me and say, we've got this PC on our desk, this cool computer. Uh, isn't there some way we could do this encryption, decryption of the one-time pad? 
with the computer. And I thought, well, yeah, that seems reasonable. You should be able to do that. So I set out in an organization that only produced hardware at the time uh, and did something that had never been done before. So lesson if you're a, a hacker or want to be a hacker or want to pursue a career in this field, uh, one of the motivators, if you ask people that have gotten started in this industry early on, uh, if you ever had somebody tell you you can't do something and that you see as motivation to do it anyway, that you might be a hacker. So uh, I had to basically hack a whole system where there was uh, design specs, there was rules to follow, there was... Uh, uh, I had to go before a board of directors, essentially, for a NSA and, and sort of pitch the concept, get them to approve to actually do it, and then go off and do it, come back and present what we'd done. I had to go through security evaluations and get the whole thing approved. And when it was finally approved, uh, the, the senior management, this board of directors, essentially, they sort of begrudgingly said, well, you, you've met all of our criteria, so I guess we have to let you do this. Um, but don't do it again. So to my knowledge, I produced the first software-based encryption system that NSA ever produced. Um, I had a, a rudimentary sort of like Microsoft Paint kind of program on my computer, and I redrew a, a Calvin and Hobbes comic strip years back. Uh, it's funny to me, probably more so than you, but I drew this thing sort of pixel at a time. It was all like freehand. Um, and, and what's in there, though, is something called the Functional Security Requirement Specification, which was a big, huge document of all the rules of how you built hardware back in NSA, and I had to rewrite it for software, so kind of make it up as I go along. Um, the other thing that I did early on in my career was I was working with U.S. Special Forces, and they used a one-time pad that used as their encryption algorithm, their method of producing cipher, was something called a visionaire table. And there's a sample of that. It's basically the alphabet uh, offset against itself 26 times, but it's a reverse alphabet. And that produces unique three-letter combinations that the special forces would memorize, one letter being plain text, one letter being key, because a one-time pad is just a, a stream of key, and then the third letter would become cipher. Because the three letters are unique, they're reversible, so it works in reverse. Um, they had it memorized. I didn't. So I just came up with this wheel because I'd been through a bunch of crypto classes, learning about classic cryptography, learning about cipher wheels. And I thought, you know, we, there ought to be a, a way to make a cipher wheel out of this visionaire square. So I came up with the concept and I just did it for my own benefit. Um, but they liked it so much, they actually kept stealing it from me. And so finally I said, would you like us to make these for you? Yes, we would. So we ended up making 15,000 of them and distributing it to special forces. I bring this story up to you because just a couple weeks ago I was at a conference and somebody asked me, a friend of mine, uh, who I thought knew my story about the Visionaire Wheel, he said, have you ever heard of the Diana crypto system that uh, was used by Special Forces? And you know, I sort of scratched my head, no, that doesn't sound familiar to me. Um, so I Googled it and I, I found this page on Etsy where some guy out of wood made this thing that looked a darn lot like this visionary wheel that I'd created, and it's labeled Diana Crypto System. Um, so the guy that I was with, I showed him a picture of my wheel, and I said, does it look like this? And he said, yeah. I said, did you know I invented it? And he's like, no. So, so the upshot was I got in touch with the guy that built these things, and uh, he, he was approached by someone that was a professor at the uh, uh, military war college, uh, I think it's up in Pennsylvania, Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and the guy was ex-Special Forces and wanted to have the, the history of these wheels preserved, and so he had commissioned this guy to make a bunch of them. I've interacted with the guy, I've emailed him, he actually sent me several of them, they're up here up front afterwards, you can come take a look at them. They're show and tell, please, but take a look at them later. Th this is essentially what's up here on the stage right now. The guy that I'd been talking to, he had seen a, a copy of the wheel on the, uh, actually on Instagram. Uh, and so that's a picture of the actual, one of the production models. That's like the coolest thing I ever did at NSA. And I did it in like the first two years I was there. I've been kind of, you know, coasting ever since. But I got a cash award, uh, for making this thing. And my boss, when he wrote up the little write up abstract to, to put me forward for the cash award, he entitled it, Man Reinvents Wheel. <laughs> um, 
the middle part of my career, I became a cryptanalysis intern, and I moved over to the operations side of NSA, which is what most people know NSA for. You know, that's the, you know, communications intercept, collecting information from all what used to be just, uh, you know, foreign powers, our adversaries, our enemies. Uh, we won't get into the politics of what NSA is doing these days. Um, but I happened to be there during the first Gulf skirmish, Desert, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, so I got an award for that. Um, I have a nice little certificate at home. It was very interesting to see sort of everything working, though, at NSA. And so I, I spent the middle part there. My last tour as a cryptanalysis intern, um, I, I went up the road from Fort Meade back up closer to BWI Airport. And I, I'm sorry, I take it back. We started out down at Fort Meade. We moved later. Uh, but I went back into the InfoSec side. Uh, working as, uh, in an organization that was doing fielded, fielded systems evaluations. Because somewhere along the line, we figured out that the way NSA very often intercepted communications and were able to break encrypted messages and coded messages was because we were able to take advantage of the people that were using them, misusing the systems. Very often, they wouldn't change default settings. Very often they would reuse key more often than they should. You know, one-time pads are unbreakable, but if you take a pad of key and use it more than one time, you're introducing vulnerabilities that make it susceptible, susceptible to being compromised. Um, so I earned my uh, one certification of crypto, uh, as a cryptanalyst in my final days. And in this final shop, this final tours, is basically the bulk of the rest of the talk. So... What I call 3.0 of my time at NSA is in the Fielded Systems Evaluation Group. Um, my first assignment was I had to do some sort of a technical analysis and write a research paper to earn my cryptanalysis certification. This is the device that I looked at. Um, I don't know if they're still using it, but this was like one of the first digital, you know, take an analog voice, encrypt it, digitize it. I think it was digitize it, then encrypt it, and then send it, reverse it on the other end. Very often the message or the voice that came through when it was had gone through that whole process sounded a lot like Donald Duck, uh, but nonetheless it was a secure system. I had to evaluate it to see if it was still secure, wrote a paper, that's what earned me my certification. Yep. But then something happened and changed the world. Does anybody know what this date is known for? I'm sorry? Very close. This was the date that the first, what came to be known as the commercial version of the World Wide Web browser known as Mosaic, uh, came out. It wasn't the first browser, but it was the first commercially available browser. And that kind of changed the world because everything now focused on the Internet. And that's actually what it looked like back in the day. Uh, as I said, one of these rudimentary screenshots. Uh, but thanks to Google, you can find stuff like that if, you, if you're willing to hunt for uh, Hard enough. Does anybody remember this? Has anybody been around long enough to remember it? A few of us old timers. Were you? Excellent. Very good. You should be giving this talk. Okay. Um, you know, and then it became, you know, because the internet became more publicly aware and more publicly available, of course, the, the idea of there being hackers and bad guys out there, uh, became more prevalent. Uh, some of the early books that were sort of my, my textbooks, my Bibles on how to do, uh, security were books like these. Anybody know any of these books? Some, some of us might, same hands are going up. It's the old people in the room. Raise your hand if you're old. You can be able to say yes to my questions. Um, so, uh, I, I've added this just in the last week. One of our, our main inspirations, and for a lot of us, the people that are raising their hands, uh, was this guy. Uh, Clifford Stahl wrote a book called The Cuckoo's Egg. Uh, in 1986, he noticed that, long story short, because I don't have time, he noticed somebody was breaking into the university computer that he was working on, and he took it upon himself to figure out who it was and catch him. Uh, a fantastic story. He, he created things that had never been done before, and, and some of the things that we take for granted now in terms of forensics and, and detection and, and you know, threat monitoring, threat hunting. He was doing it sort of analog back then. Um, I happened to meet him last week. I was at a conference earlier this week in Canada. So, you know, one of my fanboy moments was I got to meet the, the actual Cliff Stahl. Uh, 
read the book, or there's a Nova special that you can find on YouTube. Uh, just Cliff Stall Cuckoo's Egg, put that into YouTube. You should, I think it's the first thing that pops up. It's about an hour long movie where all the real people act it out. So he acts in his own story about his story. It's kind of cool. Um, so anyway, this, this group, the Fielded uh, Systems Group, we started learning about what we called at the time networked computing systems, and we started looking into learning about hacking and breaking into things. Back in those days, it was all Unix-based systems primarily. Windows was kind of around, but most organizations, most enterprises were working on Unix, so that's where we were kind of cutting our teeth. Um, you know, because it became so popular, management got got a hold of it, and so, you know, any good bureaucracy is going to do what? Reorganize. So they formed what came to be known as the Systems and Network Attack Center, SNAC for short. Um, they pulled the best of the best, and it is basically a big, big reorganization, but the focus became more, we're going to focus on this whole internet network security type of thing. Um, I actually worked in the office that was called C4. We kind of thought that was cool. Um, this was sort of our uh, early marching orders. Um, these, these are the things that I worked on at the very beginning. Um, we assembled a team. Um, the, the deputy director at the time, uh, this is more or less, a, a, you know, it's from memory, so it's not an exact quote, but he had this vision that, you know, just hire a bunch of these long-haired, weirdo, you know, pale-faced people that hide in rooms, really smart hacker kids, pull them together, and we'd have this center of excellence, and we, we'll be better than everybody. That was his belief. Um, there was a small group of us that were mostly working in this networked uh, systems branch of fielded systems evaluation division that we sort of coalesced together and we took it upon ourselves to learn hacker methodology, hacker culture. One of the first things we did was we took a road trip. Back in those days, uh, the Air Force sort of owned the network for all of armed forces. So they set up the first uh, network operations center. They had the first security operations center. So they were ahead of the curve on a lot of things. They were based down in uh, San Antonio, Texas. So, And they had a group called the Air Force Information Warfare Center. So we took a trip down there. We got to meet some of these, the guys that were uh, the leaders of that group, two uh, Air Force captains. Uh, Captain Zeiss on the left, who unfortunately passed away about a year and a half, two years ago. Captain Waddell. These are the guys that we met with down there. These guys, again, this is only going to be uh, appreciated by the old timers. They they spun off the Air Force, pretty much the first commercial uh, organization that was focused on security. It happened to be called the Wheel Group. And like any good security company, they very got quickly got snatched up by Cisco. So they, they only existed for maybe a year and a half or two years. Um, that's that sort of comes out San Antonio. I meant to make that white font. We took this trip to San Antonio. We got to see all sorts of cool stuff. They had an Air Force Museum. Anybody know what that plane is? Yeah. You know, recently declassified 20-some years ago when we went down there. Um, anybody know what that plane is? This is totally off subject, but it's cool stuff. That's the Warthog. That one Desert Shield, Desert Storm, that was the, the plane that was going in and bombing, blowing up all the tanks and everything. Uh, of course, we saw the Alamo. And if you've ever been to San Antonio, San Antonio has a river walk. And what we discovered, which is very important when you're building a hacker culture, is the 46-ounce margarita. We actually only had one drink that night. And... Um, there, were, I was the driver of the minivan we had. I think there was four or five of us down there, and the other guys were sort of laid across the seats and the floors in the back of the van. We made it back in one piece, uh, and we bought one of these glasses that we came to call the Orb, and we brought it back because we're geeks. We're trying to build the hacker culture. The biggest thing we learned down there, though, at Affleck was they, you know, they didn't have the traditional sort of cubicle land office structure. They had everything pushed to the corners, and they had a literal round table. I had to work really hard to find anything that looked like it. But they said they would have everybody on the fringes doing their job, but if anybody ever had a question where they wanted to talk and converse, they would call round table. Everybody would spin their chairs and come to the middle. And we thought that was really cool. So we created that in in our office. Oh, and speaking of office, we needed to have our own space. So the office, again, sort of building this this culture of we want to be hackers and you know geeky and nerdy and different. 
we named our office the Pit. Um, the Pit was was we're local here. It was right down by BWI, the the buildings that are on the approach to building to BWI. Um, this particular building is called Fanex Three. The pit was sort of in that corner. I forget whether it was the second or third floor. And the reason I bring this up is because a couple years ago there was a book came out called Dark Territory. Anybody heard of the book? Read the book. A few different hands. Um, in this book, on the fourth chapter, which is entitled Eligible Receiver, um, there's a paragraph in it that I like to do this as a dramatic reading. Um, in the middle there, during its most sensitive drills, the red team worked out of a chamber called the pit which was so secret that few people at NSA knew it existed, and even they couldn't enter without first passing through two, not one, but two combination locked doors. So somehow the legend of our office, which we nicknamed the pit, made it into a book. So we thought that was kind of cool. Um, we also had to work on, you know, how are we going to do this thing called hacking and breaking into things to test the security of it? We didn't have anything back then. So we we worked on developing a methodology. Um, and, of course, we were doing something different, and so we ran into a, you know, because we were working for a government organization, we ran into some red tape, but we had some ground rules. Um, one of the important ground rules, at least from our management's perspective, was uh, everything that we were doing against classified systems had to be classified at the level we were doing. Keep that in mind. Um, because we were doing something that was kind of different that they didn't understand, they were all engineers and used to hardware, not this sort of ethereal, just working in the ether, magical software hacking stuff. We had to get permission to do everything. And permission in the government, like any good bureaucracy, takes a long time. Everybody has to put their, their, their signature on it or, or their initials to check off on it. And it would take literally weeks and months for the paperwork to go from desk to desk to desk to desk to get all these signatures. Um, that was a little bit bothersome. More on that later. Um, you know, we came up with what essentially is, I think, roughly the methodology that most of us know today. Uh, you know, it, there's a right way to go about doing this thing, f trying to figure out the security of a network. But it hadn't been written down before, to our knowledge. Uh, so we had to figure it out all by ourselves. And lo and behold, it's pretty much what we have today. Um, but, you know, what some people call OSINT these days, we simply call it recon. Uh, we would decide what our, our targets were going to be by trying to discover things on the network. Uh, figure out based on what we were seeing, how we would approach attacking it and trying to break in and so on and so forth. Um, when I was putting this talk together originally, I had to start thinking, well, gee, what didn't we have? Because, you know, there's so much that's automated these days. There's so many tools available. So, you know, this is not a, certainly an exhaustive list, but, you know, just so you understand how hard it was to hack back in those days because it was cold and it took us 15 miles in the snow to walk to the computer. We, we didn't have some of the basic fundamental tools that a lot of people uh, take for granted these days. So please have pity on us, old timers. Um, a little bit of our trade craft I, I would like to talk to you about and, you know, what we did have. Um, and this is where I need to sort of reiterate the disclaimer that uh, – Anything that we use as, as far as an attack tool uh, was technically had to be classified at the, at the level of the target that we were going after. And because we were NSA, we were naturally going after top secret networks. So everything we did got labeled top secret and above. So my disclaimer is I'm not going to talk to you about things that we necessarily were using. I'm going to talk to you about things that were used at the time. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You with me? All right, so we had network sniffers. They were hardware. They were devices. They were like 30, 40, 50 pounds, and we would wheel them around on carts and plug them into the networks in the network's office. Yes? It's mostly a joke. <laughs> Stay with me. <laughs> um, Tongue-in-cheek? Um, one of the, one of the first, uh, vulnerability scanning tools was a school, uh, a tool called Satan. And it was really just designed for network administrators to figure out what was going on in their network, thus the name. 
Uh, another fanboy moment I've had in recent past is uh, I happen to be on a, one of the hosts on Paul Security Weekly, and we had a chance to inter- interview the authors of Satan uh, back, I think it was in November, um, Vitsa Venema and Dan Farmer. One of the one of my favorite interview segments that we did on Paul Security Weekly. Um, oh, another date popped up. Anyone? Probably not going to guess this one. This is when something called Bug Track started to be published. Back in the day, the way you found out about vulnerabilities was not looking at different vulnerability disclosure databases or vendors to close disclosures. Uh, you went to Bug Track. And Bug Track was a place where people were just sort of mostly network administrators getting together talking about problems they were having, things that they encountered. And they'd say, well, here's what I'm, here's what I'm dealing with. Here's the commands I'm entering. Here's the output I'm getting. Help. And, and people would collaboratively work together to try to figure things out. Well, that, that was a great resource for discovering vulnerabilities and misconfigurations in networks and how to fix things. Uh, so this was something that was available to us as a resource as well. Um, so this is an example. It, it was an email list essentially back in those days. This is just an example of uh, what a bug track uh, message would look like. Uh, we also had uh, what was called CERT advisories, uh, com- computer emergency response team, and there were various flavors of CERTs out there, and they would put out advisories, usually early warning messages of hacker activity. Uh, does anybody bother to read this? The print's kind of small. Uh, but this is a, a, a real CERT advisory that was issued on July 4th, 1996, talking about uh, alien malware, essentially, and, and how to look out for it. And if you've seen the movie, the way that they bring down the aliens is they insert a virus into the mothership. That's a joke. Awesome. Not classified. Um, we did do open source collection. Um, this is... Usually on a bigger screen, I can't even see it on my screen. Um, back in those days, there were, you know, most of the information that was on the internet was really on databases, usually on university campuses, on mainframes. So there was various uh, database lookup, very rudimentary, rudimentary tools where you could look up things, things, things that were called Archie, things that were called Gopher, that were different sets of computer uh, databases, network university databases, where you could do some rudimentary searching. Um, There was no such thing as network address translation back then. Everybody was internet routable. If you were a company, you went out and bought your IP address space, whether it was a class A, B, or C, or some some subnet portion of that. And it was all DNS, and it was all pretty much freely available. So you could do lookups and find out what your target space by just typing in the name of the company that you're going after. Or in this case, it was the military. Um, but again, you know, this is stuff that was available at the time. Um, there's an example of Gopher. Uh, before Google and before Yahoo, there was this thing called AltaVista, which was one of the early search engines, which was my personal favorite. Uh, and then there was simply, uh, you know, the network browser, Netscape came along after. That was sort of the commercial spinoff of Mosaic. And then, of course, the original Yahoo, which if when you went there, one of the options on Yahoo, the old timers will remember this, was they you could click on sort of a roulette button and they would just take you to a random website because they wanted people to just start looking around the web and discovering things. These are the things that we had available to us at the time. In terms of doing target, a- target acquisition, we didn't have Nmap. We had something called Strobe. Strobe was a was a, a port scanner, mostly TCP based. Uh, didn't have a I forget whether it had UDP, but who cares about UDP? We were mostly looking at TCP. Pop quiz. Does anybody know who wrote Strobe? Give up. Julian Assange. Think about that one for a while. Um, various. Various other things where you could look up uh, network information. Sort of NS lookup was a, lo- a way of looking up, uh, you know, the, the names of systems. And then we also had network mapping tools. Fun stuff. Uh, another date. Anyone? This is the date when Crack was published. Crack was one of the early password cracking, primarily Unix passwords. One of the primary cracking, password cracking tools we would use. Back in those days, if you were on a, a Unix system, 
you could go look at the password file. It wasn't hidden or masked in any way. It was pretty much world readable to anybody. And this is what it looked like. I, I've blacked out uh, the actual people's names because this is a real file. But, uh, you know, you would have the username, the user ID, and then right after that, you would have the hash of the password. So you could grab that, feed it into crack, and just like we do today, still, 20 some odd years, 25 some odd years later, pop out the password that's password or spring 2019. Also, you know, we were doing it back then too. Um, one of our common attack methods then also, again, because it was Unix, was to find programs that were running in what was called set UID zero, which meant the program ran as the author, which, and the author was set to root. So a, a, a very common trick of breaking uh, into a system and getting root privileges was to find one of these programs and just figure out a, a way to halt its execution or to break its execution because very often they would stop and halt and just stop in, in the state of they were root and they'd drop out to a shell. You get the root prompt, you, you do a little root dance and be excited. We, what do we call it these days? Popping a, popping a shell? We used to call it the root dance. Um, so those was those were a lot of the techniques and the things that we had available to us at the time. And uh, as I said, doing all those things uh, on one level was problematic because it would take so long to get the permissions to do all these things. There was also sort of the, this political power struggle going on because, again, uh, NSA, uh, in addition to them being, you know, at a management level, being kind of weird about, you know, how... You know, what are you doing? This is all kind of foreign to us. There was also some concern, very legitimate concern, that uh, what NSA does, according to our charter, is we only do it against foreign adversaries and foreign powers. We're not allowed to do what NSA does to U.S. citizens. And so even if you're doing it, you know, from a good guy perspective, from a white hat perspective, you know, we're the good guys trying to break in to tell you what all your problems are. This became problematic. Um, Oh, another date. Anyone? This is the date that PGP came out. Um, try to be very brief. Uh, there was a day uh, in our office when an edict came out. Uh, one of our customers uh, was was thinking about canceling a multi million dollar you know crypto project with NSA. Because they were asking the question, well, the PGP's out there and it's free. Why don't we just use that? So an edict went out from the on high. Everybody stop what you're doing and try to find an attack. We got to break PGP and prove that it's not worth using so that we don't lose our customer. Um, long story short, there's a couple guys that figured out an attack against it. Here's the attack. They, they found a document. They found some un unused byte space in the document. They inserted some code. They put it in an email as an attachment and coerce the uh, recipient into clicking on the attachment. At that time, the, the code would execute, copy the PGP key rings into a file and send it out the next email. What is that? It's phishing. Yeah, this was like 1994 or 1995. Um, the guys that did it, they got all sorts of cash awards. They'd saved the day. They got paraded around all sorts of government facilities. They were down in D.C., you know, the Pentagon. Everything was going on. Some months later, they did a, a brown bag lunch to tell us peons that were just in the office uh, what they had done and just, you know, talk about the work they'd done. And I, I went to this brown bag session, heard, heard them you know, describe their attack, and when they got to asking questions, I raised my hand and said, wouldn't that work against our stuff? And they paused and said, yeah. I'm like, so what's the point? And they're like, well, we weren't hired to, you know, we weren't asked to attack our stuff. We were asked to attack PGP. We solved the problem. That is NSA back then. I'm sure it's changed a lot. Another fanboy moment. I got to meet Phil Zimmerman last October. We were at an ISSA conference together. So I don't have many fanboy, fanboy moments because the people that are my he heroes are somewhat older than me and not always around and sometimes hard to find. Um, so here's one top secret that I will reveal to you. Again, it's tongue-in-cheek. Okay? Don't worry. Who, who thought this was going to be a problem? Here's one of the primary attack tools that we use. Let that sink in. If we were following the rules, we had to wait a month to issue a ping command. 
because we had to have 12 levels of management sign off on the fact that we were doing pink. Obviously a problem. Obviously not really classified. Obviously there was a misunderstanding. So we had to talk to the lawyers. We had to talk to our general counsel. For some reason, I volunteered to do the job. I, I think it's because I have a brother that's a lawyer. Uh, and I was technically a business major in college, so I felt like I could communicate with people. So we set out to talk to the, the lawyers because they understood that uh, conceptually, you can't wait a month to issue a ping command. But what they wanted to do was understand exactly what we were going to do ahead of time so that they could sort of pre-approve it. So they wanted us to initially just go through every attack methodology and tool we had so that they could understand it. And when we got asked to do a job, we would basically say, well, you know, we have client A and they have network B. And so we're going to use three of these and two of these and sort of pick from an a la carte list that they'd pre-approved. So we set out, and I set out to explain to them, it doesn't work like that. You know, there's you don't know what you're going to do until you encounter what you're going to do. So I set out to teach them more of the process and the methodology, at the same time explaining to them how the tools worked and the things that we used back then. And, and most of the tools we used back then were really Unix commands. There were features of the operating system that you, you know, we knew a little bit more about how they the, how they worked type of very often. Um, we did this on a weekly basis, and this was a cool show at the time, Home Improvement. So I called the time that I spent with the lawyers tool time. Um, word got out. We were doing this stuff, you know, mostly within NSA and within, you know, the DOD uh, customer space, if you will. Um, but word got out, and uh, there came a time uh, where, and this is a... a, a, a a copy of a report that was written sometime after it that talks about how the story that I'm about to unfold to you. But basically, we were approached by the Department of Justice and asked to do a, a vulnerability assessment of their Internet presence. Um, at the time, uh, obviously, the DOJ was an unclassified network. That wasn't NSA's charter. Uh, the organization that was supposed to be doing that at the time was NIST. NIST at the time didn't really have much of an operational capability, so they would always sort of hand it off to NSA anyway. So there's a way to do this, and I had to set out to learn sort of the, the political uh, hoops to jump through to make all this happen. And one of the things I was told, I happened to be working with the lawyers anyway, so they guided me through this, was that uh, it, you know for this to be done, it sort of had to be done as a favor between cabinet-level positions. So the Secretary of uh, Defense got uh, this email, uh, I'm sorry, letter, memo, uh, from the Secretary of, um, what's the Secretary of Justice? Attorney General, thank you, uh, who at the time was Janet Reno. So this is an actual letter that I kept a hold of uh, where Janet Reno asked uh, the, you know, the Department of Defense, hey, could you have those NSA guys do their thing over for us? Um, this is a copy of the, of the response that went back. It took several months as I said, to get to this point because it's a bureaucracy. Uh, but you can see in there, somewhere down at the bottom, I'm named as the primary point of contact for NSA going to help do the DOJ thing. Right before we got a chance to deliver this email or, or this memo, I keep, sorry, in the past it was paper. Uh, before this was delivered, this happened. Uh, one of the first, if not the first, you know, hacks of a, of a government website, the DOJ website was compromised. So I came in on Monday morning and got a phone call from the guy that I was working with at the DOJ saying, help, we've been hacked. And I, I pulled together a team of people and we went down and tried to help them do the forensics. But back in those days when you had a web server, you hosted it on your own servers in your own network and you made it available to the Internet. So when they discovered that this hack had happened, the first thing that they did was literally pull the plugs on the server and wipe it clean and reload it. So there wasn't any forensic rules back then. There was, you know, there was no training courses again. Um, actually, that was one of the outcomes was I contributed to one of the first SANS uh, documents on how to do incident handling. And, you know, rule number one, don't destroy the evidence. That's what the hackers are trying to do. Um, so anyway... It caused a big political issue. There's a longer story out there that I won't that I won't go into the details on. Um, but because I was there rep and a team of us were there from NSA, after several days, somebody blew the whistle on us and and called foul. 
and said, why is the NSA that's responsible for classified networks doing something for the DOJ, DOJ that's an unclassified network? Long, boring story. Uh, the upshot shot of it was most of us left, uh, myself included. So um, full disclosure, the pit was actually six guys originally. Uh, four of us left. Two of us are still at NSA. The only other person that I'm allowed to publicly say, because I have his permission, that was part of the original pit is Ron Gula, the, the, the Ron Gula, the founder of Tenable Network Security. So he and I have known each other for about 26, 27 years. We were both members of the original pit. Um, after that, what, what happened after most of us left in, in the 96, 97 range? Uh, June 1997, Remember that slide I had earlier about the book? Uh, the exercise eligible receiver happened. Eligible receiver was the first joint uh, hack that NSA did of all the armed forces. It was designed to be something like a two- or three-week exercise, and they called it after about 36 hours because they'd blown through everything and, and they were done. And so they pulled the plug on it. Um, it was back in... It's 2017 now. They actually had a uh, a meeting, uh, a seminar that they called Cyber at the, Cyber at the Crossroads. Um, so if you Google that, I think the website's still up there. That's the site. Um, but they got all the original players together, and they talked about the whole eligible receiver thing. Um, it's an interesting historical lesson in how bad the network was back then. Of course, everything's much better now. Um, another date. Just to put things in context, this is about a year after I left NSA. Anybody? NMAP. So I did enjoy NMAP in the early days, just not when I was technically working for the government. Um, the pit, most of us still get together. We try to get together at least once a year. Uh, a couple times ago, one of the guys who still works at NSA uh, brought some trinkets that he had actually gotten at the National Cryptologic Museum, which I encourage everyone, if you haven't been there, to visit sometime. They have a gift shop, and they sell things like NSA secret sauce. Uh, they sell pens that actually have a, a, a little bat signal built into it, and so the NSA seal is actually being projected by that pen onto a, just a coffee mug we were out at a restaurant. Uh, they've got t-shirts. They've got flasks, they got shot glasses, all sorts of cool stuff, and it's a really cool museum. I encourage you to visit it. Um, if you're interested in what I'm talking about uh, and want to hear more, just a, a little bit of a pitch of, about me for a little bit. As I said, I'm on a, a Paul Security Weekly. I'm one of the hosts on that. Um, if you want to learn about the history of hacking and freaking from the 70s through the 90s, uh, there's an, a charitable organization called Hack for Kids that put out a, a fantasy game, card game, uh, a year ago, called Freaker Life. You can find it on Freaker.life. Uh, each card has a little piece of hacker freaker history. It's a really good learning tool. It's, it, it, you know, Hack for Kids is designed to teach young people about uh, hacking, and so this is one of the learning tools that they've come up with. It. One of the one of the features is there's eight face cards called Enhacronisms, and I got to be one of the first uh, face cards on this on this deck. And then more recently this year, there was a book published a couple months ago called Tribe of Hackers. I was fortunate to be asked to be one of the contributors to that book. Uh, next week, I'm actually going down to Texas. They're hosting an all-day Tribe of Hackers Summit uh, on Thursday. Uh, if you're not going to be in the Austin area, they're going to be live streaming the event. I think it's 9 to 5, so I guess that's central time. Uh, so if you have a chance to just put it on in the background while you're doing your job next Thursday. Uh, tribeofhackers.com, if you go there, you'll find the information. Um, I'm also a Jedi Master. I occasionally get escorted to talks by uh, stormtroopers. And uh, one of my special moments the last couple years is I got to be Come what's called the, a member of what's called the Cabal of the Curmudgeons, which is a bunch of basically old farts that get together with Gene Spafford. Uh, Spaff, uh, he's the guy that's, uh, third in from the, from the left, the beard and, and, uh, open. He's usually wearing a bow tie. That's what he's known for. He's from Purdue. He's the, one of those books in the early slides, the, uh, basic internet and Unix security. He was one of the co-authors. So he's been in this business for like 50 some odd years, you know, really bright guy. And I got a chance to hang out with him. Um, 
coincidentally or not, uh, the person that I have my arm around, the guy in the red sweater, that's actually the lawyer that I used to work with at NSA. We've sort of we've sort of am made amends after all this stuff that happened with that whole DOJ thing. Ask me about it over drinks sometime. Um, I'm going to be doing on time. Oh, I, I went fast today. I have time for questions. I may or may not be able to answer them, and none of my answers will be classified. Does anybody have any questions, comments? Nothing. Yes. So the question was the keynote they were talking about the evolution of strong crypto, exportable crypto, and federal resistance. Well, indirectly, you know, I mentioned PGP, and and you know, we had this this whole thing about trying to break PGP. When PGP came out, uh, cryptography back in those days was uh, considered to be military materiel. It was it was, wep it was it was classified as weaponry, and so it couldn't be exported. Phil Zimmerman got into a huge amount of trouble uh, because he put out something for free that the whole world was using, and, and they were trying to stick it to him for many years. He, he survived it. Um, we weren't really in the business of exporting crypto. We were producing crypto for us, U.S., us. Um, so we didn't really directly run into that as an issue, um, but we did... We did work on things that could possibly theoretically be used throughout the world, whether people knew it or not. Put it that way. So that makes it sound like we're above the law. Is that a question or are you just waving at me? Or... Okay, yes. So the question was, before there was the concern of the confident, confidentiality of data, was there not also a concern about the integrity of data? Uh, and was that a concern back then? Uh, the way I learned InfoSec uh, in my entire time at the DOD was the idea of data security based on confidentiality, integrity, integrity and availability. We called it CIA for short. And that's fairly common. I think a lot of people know it. The, always been a concern it's been a concern for thousands of years the idea that you need to keep se your inf your secret information secret so that nobody else can read it that you need to make sure that the information is real the integrity it hasn't been altered or modified uh, the illustration that I typically use is um, sort of in a different context but in terms of the value of data uh, if you think about a, a a battlefield where there's you know a skirmish going on and you want to call in an airstrike it's pretty darn important to call in the right grid coordinates or GPS coordinates so that the planes that are dropping the bombs or these days the drones that are coming in to drop the bombs are dropping it in the right place. Extremely important information. The confidentiality and the integrity of that information is really important right up until the time the bombs drop and then not so much. So the I, I usually tell that story in the context of not only the the in terms of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, but also in terms of the value of the data, the shelf life of the data, how long you need to protect the data. Um, that was part of the determination of data classification in the DoD of whether something is confidential, secret, top secret, and so on and so forth, the higher level up. Um, not so much because of what the data is of in and of itself, especially at the top secret and compartmented levels, but it's how you get the information, the, what we call methods and sources. Um, but a, bit, a, the availability of data, sort of the third part of the triad, is making sure the data is there when you need it. Um, that, to me, that's been, you know, for thousands of years, that has been the focus of data security. And in our modern technologically connected networking, connected world, they still pretty much stand. There's a couple nuances, I think, that have been introduced um, 
that are sort of new concepts, but still sort of are related to those original three. You have a follow-up question. <laughs> I'm not going to try to repeat that. The question is, you're really worried about the data and the, especially the network traffic that gets transmitted where and how. Fair enough? Yes, it's a concern. <laughs> Any other questions? We can talk later if you want. Yes. All I see is a black square. Is that, is that five, two, or one? Ten. Oh, we got plenty. Um, interesting that you asked the question about red teaming because uh, in eligible receiver in that chapter in the book it talks about NSA's red team. When I was there, we called ourselves hackers and pen testers. And just in the last couple of weeks, I've been asking people to define what they mean by pen testing and red teaming. And I don't know if anybody uh, here that subscribes to a sort of an online a collaborative site called Peerlist. Somebody posted to Peerlist in the last couple of weeks something about, well, I'm going to define these terms, pen testing and red teaming, and I read through their terminology. I think they also mentioned vulnerability assessment, but their definition of pen testing, I would call a vulnerability assessment, and their def definition of red teaming, I would call a pen test. So my question to you, and the question is, how, do you, how does someone get into red teaming? First, I'm going to say, what do you mean by red teaming? define that, because I want to make sure we're saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're asking about the mindset. How do you become this type of person that tries to break into things maybe beyond uh, simply using tools that automate the results, but how do you take those results and put them together? Um, that's a fair question, um, and I don't have an exact answer because I, I have a suspicion that, um, that that mindset is something that's not necessarily something that you can grow, and I'm happy to be proven wrong on this. Uh, I think it's sort of a... It's something that's built into you, a, a, a natural curiosity. And, and there's certain, there's certain tendencies, I think, in our personalities that can indicate that we got it or we don't. And I'm not, and I don't mean to say that you either have it or you don't, but uh, I've met a lot of people over the years that are in this business as pen testers or red teamers or whatever you define it. People that are trying to break into things or figure out how things work or fig figure out how to break things in hopes of fixing things, whatever you call it. They all have, if they're good at it, they all seem to have sort of this natural curiosity, this propensity to break things, the, this uh, uh, drive or hunger to figure out how things work. And, and if, you can, if you can teach that to young people and cultivate that, great. Uh, in another context, I call it critical thinking. Um, and I think there's debates among scholars of whether critical thinking is something that is you're just born with and you have the aptitude that can be cultivated or whether it's something that can be taught. I, I'm not convinced that it's something that can be taught. I think it can be taught up to a certain degree. But if you don't have that little whatever it is in your personality and your character that makes you want to break things or figure things out, the, cu the curiosity, um, I don't know if that's something that can be captured. Uh, what I can tell you is like when I went to work at NSA, uh, back in 1986, I, I filled out an application because I heard that they were hiring. They asked me to come up to Fort Meade for like two or three days of testing. So I took a series of aptitude tests and I don't, you know, it was probably 12 or 15 tests. I certainly don't remember all of them, but the ones that stick out to me are, one was a, you were, you were given a, a, a page, uh, or a couple pages of, uh, paragraphs and sentences, you know, in, uh, you know, messages that had been intercepted. 
that was in a made-up language. It, it was not a language that existed. And they would ask you to figure out, you know, can you tell me what the nouns are in all these messages or what the verbs, you know, what, what sense can you make out? And a series of questions just based on sort of the construct of the language without knowing what the language was because it wasn't a real language. Um, one of the other tests that I took was simply they would show you a, a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional object, you know, let's say like a pyramid or a cone, and you had four choices, and they would say, what does this object look from look like from above, or what does this object look like from behind? Um, I happened to do well on that. I was like, oh, this is easy. You know, I, I picked out all the answers, but I met people you know, coming out of the test that really struggled with that. So... Is that something you can learn, or is that, or is that something you're born with? NSA tended to hire a lot of people with liberal arts degrees because, for some reason, they made good crippies. Because whatever makes somebody a good artist or thinking outside of the box made people good uh, cryptanalysts, which is a lot of what they do and did. Um, people that are good at puzzles, people that like to do puzzles, they tended to hire. So they they recognized characteristics over the years of people that they could cultivate, but I don't know if they ever went as far as saying you're either born with it or you're not. Am I answering your question at all? Because I don't know how to answer your question. You either got it or you don't. If you're hungry and you want to get into it, you'll find a way, I guess is what I'm saying. Time to call it? All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Feel free to reach out to me if you want. I have stickers up here. If